Welcome to the Next Canon Podcast. I'm Danny Ray, and today I am joined with the amazing and wonderful Ana Maria Campoy. Hello. Hi. Ana Maria uses she, her pronouns and is an art maker, art theater maker, a uh, director, actor, adapter, creator of all kinds. You are amazing, and I have honestly followed you on Facebook for longer than you have known that I existed. <laughs> And I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. Hi, I am too. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you doing today? Um, I am doing all right, like focused, um, you know, as best as I could be in a pandemic, <laughs> trying to find uh, focus and joy wherever I can. <laughs> That is such a good mantra. Uh, how has theater been for you during this pandemic? Um, well, it was hard. I mean, I had work lined up up till September and, and it was really exciting. Some of the stuff I was um, gonna be doing and then to have it all kind of like disappear within a span of two weeks was was we shut down orders came through, it was hard. Um, one of the things I did to cope in the beginning was dye my hair, that's why it's still pink um, you know and also to like you know I can never take myself too seriously when I have hot pink hair so <laughs> that um, I did a, a, a reading which I'm like editing together like a zoom reading because um, I'm not a uh, learning editing has been a big part of the pandemic I think with my theater world background is like someone who like doesn't have a ton of digital skills because like most of the time, most of my work is like being in front of people that doesn't require a computer and having to flip now theater, educating, uh, directing, everything is like via the screen for our safety. And it's like exciting challenges to figure out of like, how do we make this theatrical? But then the hard part is like editing and like managing that. And like, there's still stuff I'm working on that I started working on at the start of the pandemic. And I'm like getting closer and closer, but Whittling away. Yeah, and I think a big part of this pandemic has also really taught me of like patience with myself artistically and that just that process takes more time and like because everyone is like being very supportive of that in terms of com in, in community, I feel that I think it's teaching us that like, you know, you can't just be like, here's your deadline, go, boom. Like we, we are starting to take in like the fullness of that happens in a life of someone and how that might interfere with like their ability to work. And and, and I really kind of enjoy that part that is ha that conversation that is happening within um, the arts community more fervently and more productively. I think that's a really good point to make, especially since we're all doing this work from our literal homes. There's actually no separation really between work and life and that's always been a struggle as artists in my opinion for me and friends of mine it's just like trying to figure out how you spend your personal time and how you put up those boundaries because you know there's artists who are doing like four or five projects at a time and then like there's artists who can't who like only want to do one thing at that time and there's pros and cons to both of those things but it's it's definitely good to bring it into the forefront right now because it's such a huge such a huge thing happening and it's a collective yeah. conscious shift kind of and i think it's also a push to like start talking about how artists deserve living wage like we don't like we're this time to like dismantle the the struggling artist or the broke artist like mantra and like i think it's important for communities to recognize the work that we do has value and makes their communities and their lives more whole and also our artists are engaged citizens we care deeply about the places we live and we show up um, and whether it is like as engaged citizens of voting or protest march or mutual aid, like artists are in incredibly engaged with the well-being of others. Um, and just a, a large portion of like how we generally express that is through creative expression. But I've also like really recognized that through this entire pandemic, just so many artists like being boots on the ground in so many different movements and so many different ways of showing up for community. So I think that like all these conversations are happening kind of at the same time and a cacophony of things and wherever we will be when we get to the other side of it, 
Um, I'm hoping that we're taking this time now to build compassion into the system rather than using compassion to fight the system. I just got chills. Like that's <laughs> truly like something I've been hoping too. It's like this, this moment that feels like a pause for so much normalcy, like you're right, is truly a cacophony of all, all different things happening. And it's, it's so wild. Um, let our audience know uh, what area you're doing, you're producing theater in. Right now. <laughs> um, I live and work primarily um, in, in uh, the sacred lands of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people, uh, otherwise known as Seattle. It's where I'm calling from today. But I also um, work as an arts educator um, and I mentor classroom teachers. So I work with um, migrant teachers all over Washington. So I work in the sacred lands of the Wauk um, indigenous people. All, uh, um, uh, I, I'm, uh, now all tribes are slipping my head of where places I've been, but uh, throughout Eastern Washington as well, and uh, work with teachers on how to use the arts to like close education gaps, uh, where there is like language barriers or just um, just some of the obstacles that uh, migrant students may face because like of the migratory nature of being like a seasonal farm worker. Right. That's so amazing. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for just being you. Um, we're going to be talking about the theater canon in the abstract today and in the physical. Like, mm. so what to you does the canon mean and what shows do you consider to be pretty canon? What I love about the word canon, especially because I feel like it's been seized upon by like pop culture, is that like canon now is like the things we wish to celebrate and honor. And so I feel like canon is, is alive. And so it is alive, it is evolving, it is ever changing because how we choose, like how we are, um, actively trying to like remember our past and learn our past to build our future uh, requires like imagination and expansion and curiosity. And so a canon should reflect all that, you know? And we keep making more and more discoveries of like what else there has been like from ancient times to now, right? And so my, I'm just, I feel like it's, it's ever evolving. <laughs> Yeah, it totally is. So we're always basically making the next canon that never stops, mm -hmm. which is why we're here. <laughs> totally. And so what shows scream like canon to you for right now? Um, canon for right now. Uh, I think Sweat is canon. Um, like Lynn Nottage in general, canon. Um, but Sweat, I thought was incredible searing honest reflection of just the economic struggle of struggles in the united states and how uh, often capitalism is used to divide us and harm us and and the more ways like divide us than then take us down from economic classes into into race and then into uh, citizenship or documentation and like it's all in that play when I got to see it before times <laughs> years ago um, I definitely like could not stand up at the end of that show I was just so um, shaken and like it was so incredible but it was such an honest savage brutal <laughs> reflection and i freaking love that it's women over 40 like getting these meaty juicy parts and like their struggles and their fights have nothing to do with a man and it is amazing <laughs> hell yeah is what i have to say to that oh that is amazing um i i just love that it's that show i actually haven't ever seen before and i just loved hearing about it just now from you, which is also the main point of this whole podcast. I've learned so many amazing shows from so many people so far. Um, so in, in said canon, this one where sweat is like, you're like, that is mm -hmm. canon. What show has to go? I, I really think that it's time to go for Neil Labute. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> Just like, and, and I know he's like picked a lot for like beginning college freshmen because like the actions are very clear is like what I've been told or whatever. But I feel like there's better artists out there or artists that want like Neil Butte, like his, his mind in some way, like he's unafraid of showing the horrendousness of, of white cis men, but we live in that. And yeah. it's time for theater to challenge that narrative and say, no, it's time to reimagine everything. It's time to reimagine what a world with justice built into the system looks like. It's time to sh like make all these types of stories that like are normally segregated within a season or tokenized or never gets to a place where the artists get to make a living wage about it because it's maybe only ever gets readings here and there and never a full production. Um, it's time for those to be to, to have like full spaces at the table and it's time for like some stories to like we, we've lived this present and this past and we need to acknowledge that we don't want it to be our future so yeah it, it's not even necessarily like him or even like his work and then there's plenty of plays within his work that I'm like I never need to read or see or anything about this play ever again um but it's just more that like that specific of like let's just show how depraved people are we know how depraved people are we have children in cages at our border right now we know how depraved people can be we have an epidemic of of black folks being shot in the street in broad daylight over and over again we know and i'm just done with those stories i'm done that is a an incredibly good point <laughs> that people just glaze over because Neil Butte is a known name you know like students doing that like you said like first year college students will have come from a, a high school where they didn't know that it was a problem a yeah or they times. think it's really exciting that they get to say a bunch of swear words you that know and like you know, and, and, and there's like, and it's not that I'm like, oh, I'm a prude about swearing. I actually swear like a sailor quite a bit <laughs> in two languages. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's just that. It's just like, uh, open yourself up to, to, mo to more than that. Let's say that humanity deserves more. Say that humanity can be more. Like, we're supposed to be like, to be really like literary and quote, like misquote Hamlet, like actors and storytellers are supposed to be like the brief and formal abstracts of our time. So let's, let's challenge our time to do better. Yeah. And to do less harm. Because seeing plays like that is just hard to, yeah. and not in a at all cathartic or helpful way. No, because there's just, plenty of plays. I don't know if they teach. I don't know if they have anything left to teach us or show us because we're living it. We're right, living it. That's how I feel. It's like we're living it, and it's time to push through. Oh my gosh, that's that hit me in the heart. <laughs> well done. Uh, let me know. What do you think? What show that that you do not consider canon yet, but do you think it needs to be more widely known, more produced, more X, Y, Z. Um, I think uh, anything written by Benjamin Benet that needs to be more widely known. Um, ben is like an amazing, amazing Latinx playwright. Uh, he writes just really gorgeous, rich, complex um, characters. And there's there's just like there's magic and poetry in his words, but then there's sometimes like actual magic and literal poetry in the work. Um, and it is always coming from a place of like love and curiosity and I just love his work and um, yeah, I, he's, his work needs to be everywhere. <laughs> What's your favorite of his pieces? I love Querencia. Querencia to me is, um, I feel like it's this general, like I feel like people could study it and make it like it to me is like a Latinx glass menagerie because it is a memory play and it's a memory play of like how do we move forward from pain you know and but also how do we look back at our memories and and it's a coming out story it's a coming age coming of age story it's 
um, generational healing. It is, it is so many, it is so many uh, people's story that I just feel that it is such a necessary one to see. Um, and it's about how, how sometimes love can hurt us or like those who love us, those who we love the most have the highest capacity of hurting us, right? Because they're the closest to us. Yeah. They know us too well. Yeah. Yeah. That's why family dramas, like, they're, they're still compelling, right? So. Seriously. Like, Sometimes even, I... like, my favorite story of, like, a of compelling family drama, Oedipus. Um, <laughs> I had a teacher in college who told me about touring rural Texas in the 70s. So, like, 70s, rural Texas, okay? And they're performing, and it's, like, a, a professional theater troupe performing Oedipus in, like, we're like in these teeny tiny towns, like they are the art and culturals, like touchstone for that community for like the next six months to a year. And they're doing one of the monologues in Oedipus Rex and there's like a moment of silence for drama. And in the back of the room, you just hear, oh my gosh, she's his mother. <laughs> To like, we still love family dramas. There's still elements of surprise for some oh my of us. Gosh. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what how amazing theater is. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. Like she was so invested, it came out out loud. Oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> I'm like, God bless that woman. Best audience member. I love that. Oh. <laughs> audiences are really really interesting I have kid audiences quite a bit as like a direct a youth theater director and like teaching artist and it's just incredible like the stuff like that that they'll say full voice without realizing that like you're supposed to be quiet right now you know which is like who makes up the rules <laughs> well, we should get away with that like theater needs to be church especially right. like when we are all back and we finally can be in a theater space together we are going to need catharsis like nobody's business like theater is going to be a temple of grief and joy and coming together because we need it and it's going to teach us how to people <laughs> because i think we're forgetting how to people yeah because anytime again. you're near someone in public you're like oh stay six feet away from me oh yeah, no go so away so I think the arts have a bit like, you know, like in not just theater, like dance, music, like all the arts are going to be that we gather around are going to be really um, essential in terms of like helping us gather around again and making us like feel like love and we can share those moments together because like we are still in our grief. We're not out of it. We're in it. You know, so we don't even know how to mourn. And I, and I, that's why I feel like all these things are just going to be even more important, not less, when we're done. I can't even, like, I, of course I can wait, but I, I can't wait. Like, I want, I want to be with the people again. And, like, I'm not even someone who loves acting more than other things in theater. I'm an, I love directing, but I would, mm -hmm. like do pretty much anything to be in a show right now and be safe and healthy and have everyone be safe yeah. and healthy. That's the other thing. It's like, we got to remember, it's like, it's not that we just want to be together in a space is that we want everyone to be safe and healthy together in the space. And like, as long as we focus on that being the goal, everyone stay home, wash your hands, wear a mask. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the more we focus on that, you know, it's like yeah. places, places to behave, you know, like. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, behave. <laughs> oh, man, it's, it's truly, it's truly a, a hard one. And it, it hasn't stopped being a hard one since March. It's just changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on that note of change, do you have any shows that are happening right now that you'd like to promote? You don't have to be involved or anything. <laughs> Any shows? Well, I, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm, a, I'm an arts educator, teaching artists as well, and um, I teach for Seattle Repertory Theater, and their public work um, digital uh, show is coming. It's they're doing. They did an adaptation of Twelfth Night, 
from this amazing adaptation team that does uh, the public works program out of the public in New York. Um, and it's a musical adaptation of Twelfth Night. It is, I believe, over 50 people in the show. Um, and it's like like six uh, uh, equity actors and then community members. And like, I think the youngest actor is seven and the oldest is in their 80s. The tickets are free. Um, and there's going to be like a live opening on December 10th at 7.30. And then you have like the digital link that you can watch it later. But uh, Public Works is like, such a special program because it's really about like w storytelling by and for the community and I feel like more than anything we just need to remember that we have community right now and like so I, and public works is always such a joyful place to work at and so I know what we need right now especially as we enter the darkest time of the year is like joy and light and so I invite everyone to check that out um, also, uh, I, I run a mutual aid, like I mentioned briefly, called Wash Mask, uh, Washington Mask uh, for Washington Farms. It is, uh, we support uh, seasonal and migrant farm workers across Washington State. Um, we are a mutual aid, so we are not a nonprofit organization. We are entirely volunteer led. Um, the majority of our volunteers and supporters have been artists, art patrons, and arts. Uh, educators like everyone involved with the arts so that's been amazing thanks to that we started like informally in april and we have um gathered and distributed over seventeen thousand masks to farm workers across washington state over 20 carloads of food and hygiene supplies including to the colville indian reservation which was impacted deeply by the fires this past fall um, and over $10,000 of school supplies um, to Sunnyside and Grandview and other like local um, school district areas in that part of Eastern Washington. Um, we have a couple initiatives coming up and we are inviting artists to participate in. One, if you are in Washington, like Seattle, Puget Sound area is we have some food drives coming up called the Heart of Washington Drive. And we have a list of foods that we're taking that are culturally specific. So that way, when we are giving food to our private workers this season, we are really sending them a really big love letter from us to them. So they can have like, you know, there's something extra special of like having that holiday meal or having that that, that um, you know, abuelita chocolate that is like traditional and just giving you that extra warmth. So we have that happening um, in partnership with uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet and uh, Seattle Repertory Theater and uh, Village Theater and uh, Seattle Children's Theater. Um, and we also are doing um, a book drive. So if you are outside of those areas and you want to support, our goal is to get a brand new book to as many migrant youth throughout Washington State as we can, uh, pre-K through 12. So watch our social media for that. We're at, at Wash Mask on Instagram. And uh, and we have like books that you can purchase. We also have like partner, and it's all through Bookshop, not Amazon, because we want to support independent bookstores. Um, and the final thing, we have a lot of things going on. Uh, the final thing we have going on is we have this campaign that we're calling Mil Gracias, which means 1,000 thanks. And it's our campaign asking artists to thank a farm worker. So we're asking you to make a sharing on social media, post a work of art, talk about why it's important to honor and thank farm workers uh, for the food that they bring us. I mean, they have endured snow, rain, heat, smoke, and pandemic this year alone. Um, in addition to a bunch of other things going on, thanks to this administration. Uh, and so there's that way to support those who feed us in that. And then also in that post, asking you to say, like, what is one way of advocacy that you're going to commit to this holiday season? Is it calling your representatives? Is it donating to uh, the small organizations that are working directly in those communities, such as like Community to Community, which is a grassroots organization out of Bellingham, but they work all over Washington State, um, or Nuestra Casa, which is, um, out, operates out of Sunnyside uh, or other small uh, other organizations like that throughout Washington State. If you Google it, you'll find something. Um, and committing to donating that or participating in some other way. Like there's so many different ways to show up. And like I said before, like I really believe artists are just some of the most engaged 
people I've ever met, most engaged citizens. So I wanted to find different ways to get people to be involved. Like if you wanted to physically be in the space with us and like volunteer to drive supplies across the state, awesome. If you wanna like share on social media because like you're in a place where you can't leave your house, awesome. Like just show up and be in community with us whether it's virtually or in person uh, safely <laughs> um, to make sure that we are giving a really um, in time of where things are so hard um, for people to give those who feed us all year round, just knowing that we honor them and we love them and that we believe they deserve respect, protection and advocacy. Thank you so much. I'm so <laughs> loud and grateful to you for all of the work that you are doing and I just, I am going to support you for the, till the end of time at this point in my life. So Thank now you. you've got someone else in your corner just here to cheer you on and also jump in also, not just say, hey, good job, Anna Maria. Thank you. I really but, I mean, it. it's, it's thank you. And like, I really can't take credit for all the work like I did a lot of like when this first started with this it's like I do a lot of the emailings and scheduling but like honestly this is work that has entirely been done by the arts community and I'm so moved by my Seattle theater arts community of how much everyone has showed up because this is a community that I've been um, teaching in for five years and I've been it's very humbling and very honoring to work in those community it changes you forever and to see like set designers and teaching artists and uh, administrators and everyone just show up. Um, it makes me feel that like things are hard right now, but if we keep showing up, like things will change. Like things are getting, they will get better. There is no choice. There's no, there's no way around. The only way is through and the only way is through and is through with each other. And I am so grateful for my community. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're great. Um, I'm so grateful for my community for coming through in this spectacular way. Yeah. And I just want to, I just, let's keep going. Yeah, man. Let's go. Let's, let's go. go. <laughs> we know what we're capable of. Oh, I miss yeah. Seattle so much. <laughs> I want to come back. <laughs> we miss you too, but you're, this is amazing that you're doing this and like, it's having this conversation about what is canon, right? Because that, like, when it comes down to what is canon, is like, what do we celebrate? What do we honor? What do we want to remember? And as we push for that future, we also get to say, like, what, who in our past that we want to make sure they're not forgotten anymore. And I think that's so important. And, uh, or who in our present, we want to make sure doesn't get pushed aside or ignored. Um, you know, not that I'm saying Lynn Nottage is at all. She's puts frozen in a She's doing great. But I mean that just those stories are not pushed aside or ignored or tokenized. And I just think this work is so valid. And thank you for doing it. Of course, I'm here to do anything that I can to sort of help and make a difference and boost yeah. voices that need to be heard. And I think yours is one of them. And Thank I've you. been so blessed to have such willing and excited folks come talk with me and share their favorite shows with me and the shows that maybe I don't know, maybe the listeners don't know. And I think that's, that's the way to change the canon. Just tell people about the shows. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it, to me, it's like the shows like Chicago and Oklahoma, we know them because people told us about them, you know, and do we need certain shows still? Maybe not for a few years. Like let's get in some fresh blood. Let's get in some new, new shows or just underappreciated shows and that are actually mm -hmm. amazing. And then there's things that are hurtful. There's, yeah. there's straight up things that are hurtful. Like you said, there's the new yeah. view and there's other, um, plays that are more traumatic than helpful. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, and and you know, I think it's also time to acknowledge that like communities have been here, like we've been here, like you know, Latinx community, like you know, we, we the saying is like we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, you know, and and uh, <laughs> and and like you know, um, black folks have been here. Like indigenous people were here before we were. And I think it's also like a time to question ourselves of like, will we decide is theater? 
what we decide is the, how we write, how we do plays. Um, when large communities that like historically, including women, were denied um, like access to read and write. And so some of our stories and some of those um, things that are canon are completely completely oral tradition and needing to acknowledge that like I, it's so crazy to me that in theater we have a hard time like venerating oral tradition and oral histories and stuff like that whereas like the ballet world is like historically oral history like there is very few like different people who understand and can follow like dance notation like most things are passed down from like ballet teacher to ballet teacher um, and, and choreographer to like ballet master onto ballet teacher and onwards and so like sometimes i'm like y'all we don't even have to look that far like we just our, our neck, literally our next door neighbors do that. So like, why are we so scared of it? Well, like, you know, PWI organizations, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, I'm just excited. I'm excited. We have a brave new world um, that is being demanded of us because the one that it had existed uh, in, in the start of 2020, it can no longer be. No, it was, it was no longer sustainable. And an unpopular opinion is that this change was necessary you know in a yeah. in a lot of ways and it's hard it's hurtful to like say that it's, i hate that it took us to this yes like, i think that's what it is it's like the system took us to this and now it's time to like make it possible and like there's this really i've been telling everyone i know to read this speech and i'm going to tell you too okay. um grace lee boggs who's this amazing amazing uh, asian american activist from detroit wrote this beautiful speech um, called Reimagine Everything that's about like, how we need to reimagine our future in terms of like social justice and housing and food and, and also just how we look at the soul and how we look at community. And it's like, it is fire in the belly. And so <laughs> we just got to reimagine everything. You know, we got to reimagine yeah. everything. Truly. And that's, that's why I've been like wanting to use this pause in a way that is helpful for some way because we're all, we all feel a little bit stifled in one way or another, even if we're doing all of the Zoom theater in the world. It's like, <laughs> which I'm not, unfortunately, I just have not it's taken hard. that leap. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. I've loved <laughs> chatting with you and I'm so happy Same. that um, I connected with you via friends. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so on that note, since you were suggested to me by someone else, who would you like to see on this podcast? Um, well, I would love to see Ben. I would love to see my the Ben who I mentioned. Ben Benet would be wonderful. Franco, Meme Garcia, they would be wonderful. Uh, Malika Otiem. Okay. who I, is like a voice of just so many people and just like a uh, just artistic leader. <laughs> yes. um, Leah Adcott Star. There's just so many folks that I feel like are just, I I turn to their voices and their work um, for re-inspiration and to learn and they're incredible. And so I would recommend all of them. Kiki Dominguez. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> <Simone Mitchell>. um, <laughs> If you have any um, that you are like, Sorry, actually, this person, this person. <laughs> oh my God, Des. Des would be great. Oh, Des is incredible. I um, loved, I had a class with Des, uh, well, as Desdemona as my teacher, and I enjoyed the few weeks that we had together because she was working on a show as well at the same time. That's awesome. I also have several students that I'm like, you, they're like, you know, like this generation, like I love Gen Z. They're fearless. They're fearless. People were like, <laughs> you know, millennials, we destroyed the napkin industry, but like watch for Gen Z, everyone. <laughs> watch for Gen Z. They're going to eat us and I'm okay with it. <laughs> They really are. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I cannot express how happy and warm this has made me. Um, thank you so much for being here and thank you to everyone listening with us. I will have links and names of shows and people in the bio of this little podcast here and do some more of your own research and find new plays and maybe I'll have you on the podcast one day. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. Thank um, you.
I hope everyone has a great day. Um, make sure to uh, hug the people you can hug and stay safe and wash your hands. Yeah, so thanks. wear a mask. <laughs> wear a mask. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening to the next Canon podcast. Bye. Bye. And we're recording. Do we want to do a quick little like clap maybe? Sure, um, sure. Ready? Ready. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly just because they make me laugh every time because it's just like so hard on Zoom. <laughs>